So uh, welcome everyone to today's seminar. I'm delighted to have uh, Professor Darren G. Lilica here with us today. Darren is Professor in Political Communication in the Faculty of Media and Communication at Bournemouth University and Convener of the Centre for Politics and Media Research. His expertise is in the intersecting areas of political campaigning and public engagement in politics, and in particular how public engagement can be potentiated and facilitated using innovations facilitated by digital technological developments. A key interest is how people experience politics and are disaffected by that experience. And he's written on this in Political Communication and Cognition and his new book uh, in the Psychology of Democracy. Darren's talk today is entitled Overcoming uh, the Crises and Reversing the Crisis of Political Communication Towards a More Three-Dimensional Model. And the way we thought we'd structure today's uh, seminar was Darren's going to have about five to ten minutes to provide a summary of a, of a chapter that he's been working on that will form the basis of the talk. Uh, before Darren and I have a kind of conversation, similar to, as we did with uh, previous seminars in this series, we'll have a conversation about some of those key themes before we open out for questions. And you can either use the raised hand feature on Zoom uh, to turn your mic and camera on when we get to that section and, and ask the, the questions yourself. Or if you want to put it in the uh, chat and um, type it, then I can, I can read those questions out happily as well. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Darren now, who's going to give us a brief introduction to his, his paper. Sorry, Darren, you're, you're muted at the moment. <laughs> oh, of course I am. Um, yeah, um, thank you, uh, James, for the introduction and, and great to see so many um, familiar names and faces. Um, it seems so long since I've, I've, I've seen you all, um, properly at least. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, this chapter took quite a, a, a while to evolve in many ways. So I, I guess it started off with um, a keynote at um, the, the ECPR uh, Political Communication Division um, conference. Um, then conversation with my colleague, um, Anastasia Benetti, who is um, co-author on the chapter, um, which was sort of reflecting on where we are in terms of um, uh, political communication and, and politics generally, and this problem of trust. And, and over the last, um, I, I guess, two decades, we've seen these sort of crises from, you know, the first year of me having an academic job. Um, it was 9-11, then the economic collapse um, seven years later, the ongoing climate change crisis, the pandemic. And all of these seem to, to have a, a alongside them this, this sort of crisis in trust of, of do people really just trust the democratic institutions to to handle those crises and to do the best for the people in those and I think you know the passing of Jay Blummer earlier this year also looking back at some of his work and his his critique of what's been happening in in uh, public communication political communication um, you know how relevant that is but also you know, how those problems seem to be deepening. And so the, the, the conversation then with Anastasia was, well, okay, what's really wrong with it? You know, we can point at um, political leaders, whether it be Boris Johnson, whether it be Donald Trump, whether whoever it is, we can point at their faults, um, but what are the components of those faults and what needs doing about it? And between us, we, we came up with these ideas um, of what politics needs or rather, how people need to see politics working. Um, so the first one we, we were talking about was, was a service ethos, that this idea of politicians being self-serving and in it for themselves, um, what they seem to lack is, is, is this idea. And, and many of them will say that, you know, we're in public service, but people don't believe that they are. And so, they need to be able to try to display not only sort of the, the, the intelligence and skills for the role, but also um, the virtuousness of their character, the goodwill, and, and have this as an authenticity. Um, people often see that politicians, and, and if, when they view them, um, see them as, you know, performing a role, but not actually being that role. Um, 
So those whole aspects of, of integrity and truthfulness, responsibility, accountability, you know, there are those politicians that fail in those areas, but also a whole range of politicians that are viewed as lacking those, those characteristics. And so how to bring that, that service ethos back into politics and why it needs it so much was part of it. We then looked at um, inclusivity and, and the, the, the fact that many people within societies feel both marginalized and disillusioned. Um, and that's a characteristic in a whole range of, of ways in which people either don't engage or engage in ways that, that are um, you know, against what society is, is driving. Um, people who believe in conspiracy theories as, I guess are on you know, the far end of the spectrum, but many people will believe in those sort of low level conspiracies regarding what is happening within our politics um, and that, that politicians are working behind the scenes. And of course, media play a role in that as do the actions of politicians themselves. This idea though, and, and um, uh, there was a great book called Together Apart, um, the lead editor being um, a lady called Jetton, um, who talked about during the pandemic at least, um, that political leaders need to represent us, do it for us, and craft an embedded sense of us and everything that they say and do. And clearly some did a very good job and people have pointed to Jacinda Ardern in that uh, respect. Others have not done as, as good a job in that respect. Um, and of course, there is also the exclusionary language and, and et cetera around the fringes of it, as well as people having differential levels of understanding of politics. So embedded within that is, is the ability to be able to be informed and, and feel that one understands why things are being done in politics, which is also a part of uh, the communication side. And, and finally, we, we looked at empathy uh, and not the sort of the sympathy, not the, the faux understanding or you know, some of the elements we associate with populism um, who often are seen as being in touch with the people, but demonstrating that, that the politicians, they understand how people feel and can communicate messages in an empathetic way that is inclusive to all groups of people. It's not some median average person in the middle of it, um, you know, in the middle of society, but different groups in different ways are communicated to, not just when we want them to do something like have a, a vaccination, but all the way through politics of how these decisions are going to affect them and why it is a good thing, um, if it is, that is. Um, so we argue through this that, that you know, these sorts of elements um, should facilitate a, a, a healthier political culture, um, a stronger citizenship, a stronger public sphere in which people uh, feel more likely to engage and engage in a positive way, you know, contributing to decision making as opposed to the, the sort of the, the, the polarized antagonistic style of, of communication, which we, we've seen. And even during the pandemic, you know, we've seen that the, there is this antagonism at, at a political level, but then at a lower level, much more you know, cooperation going on. What politics do is tap into those elements lower in society. Um, and I guess, you know, in, in thinking through this, you know, it, we feel these elements are, are, are needed and, and very important for politics. Um, but also a way of measuring the way that politics is done that isn't simply partisan point scoring. So it's not just that we look at a political leader that either we don't like or we don't feel does the job very well or they make errors, um, but actually we can say what the errors are in that and how that they will not be carrying people with them through this. Um, and understanding that below these levels of mistrust in society towards politicians, there is also a whole range of other feelings and emotions, not only about the politicians themselves and what they do, but also um, with regards to what people want politics to do and how people want politics to be done and communicated and what sort of communication they want. So, that's, that's kind of in a nutshell where we are with the chapter. And it, it was, it involved many conversations, which, which were actually great fun, even though uh, most of them were, were virtual um, with Anastasia being in Greece and, and myself here in, uh, in Bournemouth. Um, um, but yeah, I, I, I welcome thoughts, comments and, and your uh, contribution, James. 
Thanks, Darren. And uh, I wanted to start off just by like commending you, uh, you and yourself, Anastasia, for what I thought was a really engaging paper, but also uh, particularly timely. And I really wanted to kind of, before we talk about the normative framework and those three dimensions, which I thought were really fascinating, I wanted to kind of talk about the start of the chapter where you kind of map out using Jay Bloomer's work, but also kind of developing that and thinking about the, the, the series of crises that we've kind of seen over the last 20, 30 years. Um, I want you to kind of reflect on the, the timeliness of this paper in relation to kind of government communication right now. Yes. Um, there was a particular kind of quote uh, in, and I'm going to draw on a few quotes in, in some of my questions, um, where you kind of talk about how communication is a, a fundamental and central aspect of responding to a crisis. Um, and the importance of how government communication is vital um, in terms of citizens being able to understand and work out how to best respond to these crises as they take place. And I wondered, before we talk about the normative framework and where you can see improvements in political communication and public le leadership, I wondered if you could comment whether it's on the recent Health and Social Care and Science and Technology Committee report on the handling of the first stages of the pandemic or the petrol crisis or the energy crisis, like how in these examples we can see, see um, evidence of the kind of failings of political communication by the UK government right now? Okay. Um, well, I mean, it, going back to the, 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 the report that was released yesterday, um, myself and a, a PhD student, Thomas Stokel, um, did a paper for the Journal of Public Affairs on that early period and, and Boris Johnson's style of leader. And, you know, this isn't a partisan point, but you know, Boris Johnson, he, he tries to be this optimistic character where everything will be fine and, and carry a country forward. And I think during that early period, um, that was a, a serious error. One thing because he didn't know that that was the case. He didn't know if everything was going to be all right and you know all of those, those, those issues that, that were being faced. But also it, it lacked empathy for people. And, and at the same in the, during the same week when he was saying he was shaking hands with with people and, and you know everything was fine. I had a student who was traveling down from, from London down to Bournemouth, um, who was really, really scared of getting on the tube and getting on the train. You know, there was no idea of you know face masks and nobody um, would even can well, there was nowhere to buy them, you know, they just weren't available to people. And and so someone like her was looking at this and saying, This man is mad. Uh, and so, you know, just that very, very basic level of you know, being able to pitch a message where we can see a way out of something, um, you know, that, that was a really, you know, bad way of doing it. If you don't agree with that, if you think, oh, yeah, everything will be fine, then you're fine, or at least you're not very bad at communication. If you're not, then you're, you're in deep trouble. And, and I suppose, you know, over the last, you know, the Conservative Party conference, in a way, was an example of this. And, and you know, some of those comments around, the way that that you know the twenty pound a week you know cut or you know that that cut in benefit um, was communicated had had a real lack of empathy for the conditions that 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 people are facing at the moment, with, particularly with rising prices, um, and it it just seemed you know that there was a concerted effort to almost brush it under the the carpet, ignore it, you know, so, so those sorts of elements, which, you know, is, is critical of our government and, and can be taken as partisan, but it's, it's, it's critical of the way that they communicated the, the, those things at, at key points. And there's a whole, there's so many examples of that, where you, you look at them and say, how would someone feel who is in that position? And I think that's where the empathy is particularly important there. Thank you, Darren. And I think, yeah, it's a really, you know, good way of kind of re uh, reflecting on that, how the crisis is represented through political communication. And then kind of thinking now about the, the, the normative model, the paradigm for a citizen centric model for political communication and the three dimensions you've outlined. So service ethos, ethos empathy, inclus inclusivity. Um, I want to start off with, with serv service ethos, which you kind of start off with in, in the chapter. And um, you know, again, just another quote from that section, you know, we stress the need for honesty instead of authenticity. Uh, and the literature discussing authenticity shows it's a vague and contested concept with strong links to fabrication of public image. And um, 
a question that came to my mind, which really sounds like it should be an easy question, but I found it, I suppose, indicative of our current times. It's actually quite complex. But what does honest public communication look like? And because I wonder, you know, when we think about the recent crisis that you've outlined, you know, are, th are there any examples of political, political elites for you adopting an honest approach in the way that they communicate with members of the public? Because um, for me, I, I don't know if you saw the clip of Stephen Barclay on K, um, Sky News with Kate Burley uh, going over the report uh, findings in which she asked the question, which I think kind of the obvious question, you're going to apologise. And he did the typical kind of response, you know, we followed scientific advice, there's lessons to be learnt. There was no direct, you know, no direct apology there. Mm. Um, so I was just wondering, can, what does honest political public communication look like? And is, are there examples that you could put forward to show in practice kind of where we can see that? Well, I mean, I, I suppose it, it, it's, it, it, yes, it is a very, very difficult question because it is very hard always to know what is honest in a way, you know, that, that there are some politicians that are very good at, at appearing to be honest, um, though the tarnish often warns, what, uh, wears off quickly. Um, I mean, I think some of um, Jacinda Ardern's, um, uh, it, her communication during the pandemic has been good because she has said and told the people of New Zealand, we're doing this, we don't know if it's the best thing to do, but we're worried about the consequence if we don't. So we fear this, but we don't really know. So we're going with it. Um, and, and, you know, I, th I think there is an honesty there and people will go, well, yeah, of course you don't know. You know, that's, you know, rather than this sort of, you know, very bland certainty. Um, and I think once people accept the fact that, that people tell it like it is, not in a populist way, but, but this is what we know, this is what we don't know. Um, and, and really properly explain things to people, um, not in sound bites and, and not in these kind of, um, I, 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 was, I interviewed a, a candidate um, for the Labour Party uh, in 2001 who said he, he, he felt he was a speaker weight machine, that if you pressed a button, that this, this dialogue will come out. Um, and, I, and that seems to be now most politicians, that, that they have this stock response. And it doesn't really matter if it's Stephen Barclay or it's Priti Patel or whoever it is, you know, or who's in government, when they're out there, they just give these same lines. And people see them as inauthentic. You know, that's A, not what you think, and we elect you to represent us. B, it's it's a non-answer, it's not answering a question. I think, yeah, you know, I mean that's that's a very sort of basic example in a way. But but I think there's a big difference between being honest with people and saying, this is the situation we're in, and this is the problem, and we don't know all of these things, or giving these kinds of vague answers or pretending to be certain about something when fundamentally you can't be. And, and a crisis is a great example of that. Thank you, Darren. And in terms of like moving away from those like stock responses and having more honest communication from political elites. And you know, one of the, when you, when you um, reflect on the ethos in the, in the chapter, you talk about you know, principles such as integrity, truthfulness, responsibility, accountability. Um, which again, it, it felt like, you know, I was reading this and I was thinking, this is, this is exactly what I want to kind of see in political discourse. But it made me think about, obviously, the focus in the, in the chapter predominantly is on political leadership and political elites. But I wonder what needs to change in terms of the conduct of other key actors in political communication, and namely the role of the media, if, the, if this ethos is to be established amongst political leaders. You know, can we have that honest public communication without substantive change to the conduct and culture of, and I'm kind of being quite narrow in my focus here, but, but the British media, for instance, can, can you have one without the other? Um, it, it, it is difficult. And, and um, I go back, uh, and this was something that, that Alistair Campbell spoke about. Um, Tony Blair was being interviewed by, I think, Jeremy Paxman and asked several times the question, so you don't know how many illegal immigrants are in the country. Um, perhaps the start of an agenda that would carry on. And I can't remember which election or what year it was. Ivor will probably be able to tell me exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he, he wormed his way around that. And it's fundamentally 
obvious to everybody that, of course, you don't know because they're illegal. You know, it's like saying how many illegal guns are on the street. Well, I don't know. They're illegal. You know, no one registers these things. No one counts them. But uh, the point Campbell made when he was talking about it was saying the front page the next day would say illegal immigration out of control if Tony Blair admitted it. So I think what the media needs to do is, is not always have that view on a headline, you know, that, that some things governments cannot know and do not know. It doesn't necessarily mean something's out of control. It just means they don't know. You know, it's, you know, how many people got cancer in a country? Well, we don't know, you know. <laughs> you know, it's those sort of things that people just cannot know. Um, and I think accepting that and, and focusing on dishonesty and, and spin and, and all of those things where it matters, but not focusing on things um, where, you know, it, it's, it's an honest thing to say you don't know. Um, and it seems at the moment we've got into a situation where, you know, politicians cannot apologise because that, that admits they're doing, they've done wrong and therefore the media will pick them up, pick them up on that and it will be, you know, big headlines, we, you made mistakes. Um, and I think that that relationship has, has become to some extent too adversarial, but, the, but also at some points too slavish. You know, so it, it's, it's a very strange media and landscape at the moment. Um, but you, you can imagine that if any member of the cabinet had apologized this week, even for saying, you know, if, you know, if we, if the judgment we made based on Santa evidence was wrong, we apologize. The apology, I'm sorry bit would have been the headline as opposed to context. And I think that that is a problem. Thank you, Darren. And again, moving on now to, to think about inclusivity, uh, the second kind of key dimension of the normative framework, which I think um, yeah, at the moment I'm doing some research on young people from areas of social inequality and how they engage with the news, how they engage with politics. And I think the, the points you make in this section where you reflect on people just feeling like marginalised and disenfranchised with political parties, political, political institutions, you know, is, is, is really important. And that completely relates with what, what I've been finding. And and you talk about in, in, in this section, this idea of weeness and mm. how um, in order to kind of have honest and uh, clear communication from political elites, we need to kind of have um, coherent and empathetic communication, which unites all people behind a common goal, which kind of got me thinking about this, this, this kind of this tension, I suppose, um, within kind of more, more broadly within the work on political engagement in, in kind of political communication and this tension between individualism and collective identity. And I'm thinking here of like Lance Bennett and Alexandra Segerberg's work on the logic of connective action and the idea of kind of like personal action frames being these kind of collective, uh, these, these communicative um, messages that can still be personalized. So individuals can still relate to their cause through lived experience, but there's still a sense of solidarity and collective identity that's built from that. And I wondered if there's anything in like, in the use of such kind of devices in a party political context, if, if you think that, I suppose, is there, a, is there any use of that in a party political context or is, is uh, this, I suppose, the, the fact that these messages are having to be individualized in that way, kind of part of the problem and, and we need to kind of go back to more traditional collective action frames or more traditional sense of collective, collective identity when it comes to public communication? Well, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's again a, a, a complicated area in many ways. I, I mean, I guess during the crisis, overcoming the crisis and working as one, as a people, is important. And I, and I think that you know some leaders were very, very good at doing that, and, and not just um, our own New Zealand, but you know some of the messaging, you know, even in countries where we we may not expect that. Um, you know, some of the the, the Eastern European. Um, countries that they in those early you know those early weeks if you like you know that they, they, they they pulled people together quite well around you know we need to act and we need to act you know with solidarity for one another you know if you're within our borders this is it but it is very very rare and you know parties tend to talk to their committed followers and talk about their opponents 
and and the more we have that kind of you know dialogue where you know we're we're good and they're evil or we're good and they're not as good um you know we, we end up being polarized and i think that's that's a problem for when we need to come together because if you are <clears throat> if you're not a conservative you may not pull together behind the conservative leader because he's someone you naturally don't trust so those are kind of issues that that come out of this so a, you know, we, we don't really want, we shouldn't really have polarizing language. We, we can have different perspectives in politics, but it doesn't need to be this sort of zero sum. If they lose, we win. You know, that's, that's, that's how, often how party, uh, politics is viewed. And, and, you know, within election war rooms, that is the mentality. You know, it, it's a big cheer if the, uh, the, the, the leader of the opposition party makes a mistake um and the messages start to be to be drummed out about it um and i guess we all fall into that you know during elections and, and these things but it's yeah it i think it's a problem when when, when that kind of continues and, and and that mindset continues into politics um but i think also fundamentally that, that there is a lack of understanding um of the lives of real people in politics and how they respond um you know and and on the one hand you know People saying in in the 2019 contest that that you know Jeremy Corbyn's message was one for a, a you know a, a London elite and nothing that that reached into the communities that you're looking at and and you know, you know particularly some of those northern communities um, they didn't see anything in that for them whether that's a mistake of the party or them or the news media that's that's open to debate but but they didn't see anything for them and and possibly feel the same about. The, the messages coming out of the current government. And so that, that there is a personalization that's that's needed, but it's not the kind of very basic personalization of messages, but something that uh, where people go into a community and say, right, this is what we're doing for you. This is how we're going to be helping you. Um, but understanding where they are now and where they need to be in that community and how they fit into the wider community. You know, there shouldn't be a north-south divide in a little country like Britain. You know, there shouldn't be this idea of haves and have nots, um, but there are. Um, and, and often, you know, people feel that they are not being spoken to, that their lives are not understood. Um, and largely, they seem not to engage with either party. You know, they don't feel any party is speaking to them, which is, is even sadder in, in many ways. And partly that's, you know, whether they get share of voice, but also it, it's... Um, you know fundamentally who they are talking to and i think partly because of that during elections particularly you know it's it's which votes matter um which is that could change but but it's, but it's interesting in itself i think that's a really interesting response i think that whole the way you set up the inclusivity um dimension within the framework I think really nicely touches on, you know, within journalism studies research, we've seen uh, the future of journalism. Gary Young was talking about the lack of representation in the profession of journalism mm -hmm. and how that influences coverage. And Danielle K. Brown was talking about how storytelling and how these don't, you can't talk about rejecting formalism and how we need to amplify lived experience in reporting. And what I really liked about the chapter here is how you were thinking about also like political elites and their language and their storytelling and how that lacks inclusivity in the way that the, the, the kind of uh, messages are being constructed. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I kind of want to keep my questions uh, relatively brief before I let, let others also ask questions. Um, and I mean, in terms of empathy, I think, again, was a really interesting dim dimension. And I can certainly see parallels in terms of like the, the especially around the universal credit cuts and how and how that has been um kind of justified by ministers as opposed to the coverage of people who are affected by this and the desperation they're experiencing so kind of seen it as an, you know an economic necessity to boost the economy versus you know this is this is how it will affect my life and i think that as i was reading that section that's what came to mind and again i know this is kind of similar to an earlier question you've mentioned just jacinda adern already but you you used her as an example in in the, in the chapter as being mm. um someone who's you know affected because of because of her empathetic approach. And I, I just wonder if you could elaborate on that and, and the, the effectiveness of that and, 
especially you talk there's a phrase you know being out of touch is something you mentioned in that section mm. and it was a great phrase because it made me think of a lot of conversations I've had recently about Keir Starmer with my family you know and a mm. lot of them feel that way that traditional Labour voters from a northern constituency but they just can't they don't relate to him and I think this this concept of empathy feels so important to those questions around relatability so I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about Jacinda Ardern and, and this concept of, uh, of empathy and how, how how it's used and how and why it's important. Yeah, okay, and 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 it, she's an interesting example, um, but has has things quite easy. She has a reasonably, you know, small population, um, and and you know, I, I guess not the the huge difference in 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 attitudes. Though, though New Zealand is quite complex, but. What she seems to to be able to communicate is that she feels the same as the people do. And she can both tell people you know, how she she talks about how she feels. Yeah. And, and, and that's very, very different from saying we feel or I know you're feeling. But but that kind of, you know, when I heard this, I felt this, you know, and she said how worried she's been about the pandemic. Um, she said how shocked she was um, at the end of the, the, when she heard about the, the, the shootings in, in Christchurch at the mosques. And so these sorts of points that, that she, she managed to convey her emotions and feelings, um, which seems to be unscripted. She's just telling you how she feels as opposed to telling people how they should feel and how they, you know, or how they do feel without always including herself in it. And, and there is a, a semantic difference there. Uh, 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 this, this links into something else, uh, another conversation I was having about that, that sort of the, the uses of we's and I's and, and things like that. And that during, you know, shocking events and crises, saying something that, that, sounds like it's from the heart or preferably is from the heart you know people can identify with that people know how you feel not how you're telling them they feel and and that's that that's that's i think a very very big difference in in the way that she communicates is that you know she 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 doesn't speak you know as a mother i feel this she, she she'll just say well yeah i'm really worried about my children i'm really worried about this i know this is difficult um and people feel that that she's in it with them as opposed to doing it to them and i think that's yeah a, another difference you know why why what she has done has worked well and why others perhaps haven't and it only needs a small example you know whether it be you know boris johnson being away in a in his pal's villa or whatever it is you know all of these examples sort of stack up and, and people see politicians as being as living very different lives from them and not sharing those experiences. So not understanding the, the importance of, or the, the impact of a cut such as, you know, to universal credit, you know, how would they know? Um, whereas perhaps, you know, Jacinda Ardern could maybe communicate that in a way where people would think that she has. I don't know much about her history. That's a, a, rather, a rather broad, um, you know, comment, but, but there is, there is that element to it of, of people believing that she does think like us and she does understand us as opposed to, you know, feeling they don't and them being able, unable to convey the, uh, that, that feeling that, that, yes, I have lived the same life. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, I think it is a very, very difficult thing to be able to convey emotion. Um, and some leaders, you know, Gordon Brown being example, Keir Starmer, perhaps another, who, who doesn't convey language easily. And, um, and doesn't, um, and doesn't, um, sorry, could you hear me through that? Oh, right, my computer locked on me, I apologize. Um, yeah, who, who doesn't convey that emotion and, and, and tell people how he feels. He tells people what his policies are, but not how he feels. Thank you, Darren. And, and again, just to kind of uh, to, to finish my kind of, it's not a question, more 
not a question, more of a comment, but not one of those kind of comments. But I just think as you, uh, you know, as, as you kind of go through the paper, one of the things that struck me about your contribution at the end is that, as you say, you know, this is more what's you're kind of setting out this citizen centric model of political communication. I think, as you say, you know, it, it, it cannot simply be a rhetorical device when we think about service mm. ethos, inclusivity and empathy. And I think what what the paper really struck me as, as you kind of came to the end and you talked about your contribution and, and this normative model is that this is like a, a framework for assessing the quality of, of political leadership. And it becomes a kind of theoretical contribution to that literature on, on political leadership, which I thought was, was really interesting. And it made me question, like I was looking through these three, um, these three dimensions and comparing them perhaps not particularly favorably to some of the political leaders in British public life right now. But, um, We'll leave my questions there and what I'd, I'd, I'd like to do is I'm going to uh, firstly go to a question from the, the text box and once we've done this one if if someone wants to kind of offer a, uh, a video question and we'll kind of go back and forth between the text box and, and video questions if that's okay but first off a question from Sally uh, who wants to thank you for the interesting paper Darren and wanted to find out if you've had the chance to apply these three dimensions to political leaders who seem to enjoy some level of citizen confidence in their countries e.g like Jacinda Ardern and if you think gender can make a difference in political leaders' abilities to encode these dimensions in their communication. Okay, um, I haven't had a chance really to apply it, though, of course, you know, during the, um, you know, so sort of talking about it as, as with you, uh, I have been sort of thinking about these and thinking about, you know, the extent to which leaders do not adhere to these. Um, and, you know, and I think that's you know that that's a critique of the current government over a number of a, a number of examples um, where where they've lacked empathy and um, and and also demonstrating that sort of service ethos um, just fundamentally sort of understanding where people are and what they need to hear. Um, Gender is a really interesting question within this um, because it is quite easy to look at someone with Jacinda Ardern and say there's a there's, there's different gendered styles of leadership. Um, but you know I, I think those female leaders who well who approach a, a, a crisis you know in, in the same way as you know many many women do in their own lives in, in a way where there is more understanding you know that, that it's not a sort of a warlike posture. It's not the, you, you know, either you know, I'm I'm bursting with antibodies or nothing can affect me or whatever kind of you know approach. You know that there's that. I think there is a during crises. You know, people may want somebody who is is strong and can sort things out, but also want someone to look after them. Um, so maybe some of that, you know, w without sort of gender. It, producing sort of gender stereotypes, you know, so a more maternal approach to leadership rather than the, the strong father, people maybe want the strong mother um, during those times. And, and I think, you know, that's something that, that, you know, some leaders have done very well. Um, and there's a number of female leaders who have, who have done very well. Um, sound good. And I think, you know, even the leader, Angela Merkel, who is not you know, sort of known for her, you know, sort of, you know, you know, she 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 do, she doesn't sort of you know have that sort of strong sort of like um, feminine character. You know, she she's she's in a mould of leaders in a way like Thatcher with the, you know, sort of the the um, a leader stereotype as opposed to a gendered leader stereotype, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it can make a difference, and I and I think people do, you know, read. Um, yeah, read characters differently according to what they see um, and, and how that person makes them feel. But it's a difficult one. And I think it needs, yeah, I think there's a lot more research is needed on, on the, 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 the styles of leader and how different leaders are, are seen and, and portrayed and perceived, you know, both within the media, by voters, by citizens, and also how differently just put, um, play those roles. Thank you. We'll, we'll come to uh, Ivor, Ivor's question next and then Ruth's question. Okay. So Ivor? Hey, yep, whoops, I'm out of my picture. Darren, thanks very much. Some interesting thoughts there. Um, 
I've got a but coming. You describe a situation, um, um, Lucinda, uh, the New Zealand situation aside of declining trust of non-empathetic politicians, etc. But if you look at turnout at 2019, 2017, obviously the Brexit, um, it's been pretty consistent. People are not voting with their feet, even though they find our politicians, according to you, non-empathetic. They can't relate to them, et cetera, et cetera. They're still tramping to the polls. OK, never in, not in massive numbers, but much the same as the average this century. So why isn't this disillusion reflected in turnout figures? Well, um, perhaps people hoping for the best. Um, despite that, um, I mean, I, I mean, 2019 is, is an interesting case in some respects because of the amount of people who voted for the Brexit party and whether, you know, Nigel Farage offered a, you know, a, a, an element of authenticity and an element of, of, you know, being more in touch, which people believed he was, what, whatever um we we may think um you know may, maybe that was one element in that would those people have not voted had the brexit party not stood um interesting question there um it, it's it, it's really difficult to see the 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 link between trust and and the extent to which people trust politicians um and 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 voting particularly other sorts of behaviour, yes, um, you can see a really clear link that, that people who don't, you know, feel empowered by politics, who, you know, don't you know, feel disillusioned, they don't vote, um, but and um, sorry, they don't participate in politics. But there isn't a very clear um, correlation between any of those attitudes and voting behaviour where it's been tested. Um, that it, that it seems that voting you know, remain something that, that many, many people do, irrespective of the fact that they don't seem to have strong, positive feelings towards politicians and what they do. Um, I don't have a good answer to that, um, but it, it does seem that these two sets of data, one is about trust in politicians and, and feel that politicians are in touch and, and, you know, how people feel about politics, and also there is this, this other set of data about voting. And yeah, I guess what we need to do is pull those together and, and, um, and see to what extent there is a, a clear pattern. But looking at the BES data, there isn't really, but they don't have a huge amount of in-depth questions on those trust factors. That's, I think that's one for a conversation over a pint when we get the chance. Cheers, Darren, and thanks, Ivor and Sally, for your questions. Ruth, I can see you've got your camera on. Are you happy to ask your question? Um... Yes, I was just making the point that um, a lot of government statements and, you know, these, these pointless interviews with people, uh, with politicians, are really um, deflection, that it actually the sole purpose is simply to deflect the media and not, not, not account to them. Um, and that particularly with... Uh, number 10 statements are very much about that. And that they've actually, they came into power um, and made this decision to try and communicate directly with the public and try and uh, basically put aside the media as far as possible, which is the history of hatred between politicians and the media. That goes, you know, goes back to the Leveson and period before that. And that, um, and that they, but at the same time, they are making widespread use of partisan briefing of selected journalists. So this is a, a complete um, evolution of policy uh, that moves beyond political spin. Um, and, and, but some of it has already failed. I'm making more of a statement than ask, uh, answer a question, but this attempt to introduce these TV briefings, and I'm focusing very much on, on the British case or the, the England case, um, failed completely. Uh, they couldn't cold shoulder the BBC. They couldn't ignore the, the, the lobby. Uh, and they've been dragged back into, into media communication, but this is very much something that they do not want to have to do. Yeah, uh, and I agree. And, I'm, and I, don't, I don't know if, how many people watch the news and notice these things. Um, 
but you know, do, I mean, one of the ones that struck me during the the, the Conservative Party conference was um, precisely this kind of deflection, where um, I think it was the BBC um, challenged um, Boris Johnson on the, um, the, the 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 cut, the, the benefits cut, um, and he started talking about. Um, climate change and and you know all these great jobs that would be coming through you know the, these revolutionary policies and um, it, it it completely ignored the question the issues um, and and you wonder what effect does that have on people you know has you know is is that do people see that do people take notice of that and and you know I, I'm sure there's uh, similar examples of of you know, deflection and and, and um, non non answers um, from all political sides. That one stood out because it, it it was it was very blatant. It seems the government is a lot more blatant about doing this now. Um, and and, it, and yes, it isn't it isn't spin definitely. Thank you, Darren and Ruth. And uh, next question we've got from from James. Um, Thanks for this really intriguing paper, Darren. How do you feel Nicola Sturgeon fits into your typology of leader types approaches? Is she more akin to the Ardern style, would you say, or the Thatcher one, notwithstanding her ideological differences with the latter? Um, ah, yes, Nicola Sturgeon. Um, I mean, my, myself and, and, and Ruth, um, we, we did a chapter, not only for the, the, the COVID um, of anthology that, that, that um, I co-edited, but also for uh, the work that Peter Van Elston and Jay Blumler, who um, started off the project, um, did. And, and in the latter, we, 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 we looked at, at, at the, the very, very different styles of leadership um, between um, Nicola Sturgeon and, and Boris Johnson. I think, I mean, personally, and, and you know, that this is not, you know, sort of, setting out these criteria and, and then ticking boxes. I, I think there was a much stronger service ethos from Nicola Sturgeon just by her presence. Um, you know, she, she was you know, physically there and, and not only took you know, the, the responsibility for communicating it, but also took responsibility for the decisions being made. Um, there wasn't a sense of, yes, she, she has mentioned scientists as well. Um, and, 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 you know, that she, she did try to take a more, you know, I speak for Scotland line. Um, OK, that was a Scotland juxtaposed with, with England and the Johnson government, um, which isn't wholly inclusive. But there was a, an extent to which, you know, she, she was speaking for Scotland and, and, and trying to... I, th I think she tried very hard and, and possibly did come across. I haven't seen any of it. Her ratings were very, very good. Um, but, you know, I, I think she did try to say, I understand the difficulties and, and where she was questioned about, you know, errors where people within her team or herself had, had broken rules. You know, she, she, she explained how difficult these things were. Um, so, you know, I, I think she did a good job. I, I mean, she's a very different style. You know, she, she, she's not like Jacinda Ardern, who's quite, you know, kind of normal and, and you, know, off, you know, some may say folksy to some extent. Um, and I'm not sure how, you know, comparing her with Thatcher. I mean, yes, she dresses a little bit more like Thatcher or, or Merkel, but, you know, she has her own style. Um, and I, I think it, you know, she should be read as having that style. But I think she, I, I think she, she, was a lot closer to to what we what we're arguing is a good way of communicating, um, as opposed to uh, the the um, the wrong side of that. Thanks, Darren, and thanks for the for the question, James. Um, our next question is from from Lona. Uh, if authenticity, like charisma, is in the eye of the beholder, how do you see the relationship between the concept of authenticity and the practice of honesty? Thinking of the example of Farage, the two don't necessarily go together. It's a good question. It, it's a very good question, yeah. Um, and, and I think you know people do believe, um, and, and I guess this is the, the quality of populists, you know, that that they say what they think. You know, they don't deflect, they don't spin, they say exactly what they think, and 
they don't care if anyone doesn't like it or not. Um, you know, that that's there is an authenticity about populism, whether that is because they are honest to their beliefs and, and attitudes and, and say it how it is, as, as it's said, um, or whether they just say what people want to hear, that's, you know, that's, that's a judgment about the individual. But I, I think the, yeah, it, it's, they are the opposite of the deflectors though. You know, they, they, they don't tend to deflect difficult questions. Um, they do if it's against them, but, you know, they, 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 they will, um, you know, they, they, they will say, you know, they will answer a question, they will tell you what they think personally. And I think it's, it, the difference is whether that person, you know, and, and yes, it is, it is about perception, it is in the eye of the beholder. But, you know, do we feel they're speaking from the heart or from a script? And I think that's the, perhaps, you know, the problem with a lot of politicians is they speak from a script, not from the heart. And so, you know, when they're talking about things going wrong, they're talking about something that is happening out there. You know, this is going wrong out there. It's not something going wrong in here. You know, it's not, I'm not experiencing this. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's the difference it's it's a problem for politicians, and I, I think Gordon Brown is one of them. That that you know the only emotional connection he made with an audience was his his um, interview with Piers Morgan um, after he'd been after he you know stepped down at, or been voted out as prime minister, um, but also you know that moment when he left Downing Street with the two kids in front and ended up on the front page of the newspaper um, suddenly as a dad, you know that was the first time people go, oh, he is human, you know, um, which is a problem, um, you know, for, for those people who, who don't betray emotion very well. And it's, it's an advantage to those who do, who tend to be good actors. Um, so it, it's complicated, but I, 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 I do think more politicians, A, need to be ordinary in touch with people. And so, what they, so they're able to speak from the heart. Um, and I, I think there are some very good politicians out there that can do that, um, but often they don't get into the position of leader. Thanks, Darren, and, and thanks for the question, Lorna. Uh, far, maybe the, we might have time for this question. It might be the last one from Paul. Um, thanks, Paul. And again, Paul's question is, do we overestimate how authentic and honest politicians were in the past? Are this generation of political leaders the most dishonest and inauthentic we have seen? Great final question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the temptation is to say yes, they are the most dishonest and authentic. Um, but I, no, I don't. I don't think that they are perhaps massively different from the past. But in you know history, how many times was Harold Wilson on television? You know, how many times did he have a a, a, a camera stuck in front of his face? How many really serious crises did he face? You know, so, so these sort of elements, you know, are, are I think also part of the story that, that there, there wasn't a 24 seven news focused on them. Um, and there wasn't a, 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 a kind of that more hostile press focusing, you know, focusing on them. Um, but, you know, I, I think our current um, breed, generation of politicians are, you know, that, that they've, They've kind of learned a great deal about how the media treats and can take people apart and are trying to block that to some extent. Um, but they, they're also perhaps there's a lot more professional politicians and, and professional as in, you know, they, they've never done anything outside of politics and, 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 and that public eye. And whether that is, 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 is Johnson's background, is in journalism and away in Brussels and you know, along the, the fringes of the Conservative Party for many, many years, as well as his, his many sort of you know, MP mayor roles, or Keir Starmer, you know, his, his long career in, in law. You know, it, it, you know th these are people who have become trained to do certain things in different, very, very different characters, but trained to, to deal with these sorts of situations professionally. 
Um, and so, you know, finding out who the person is inside is, is difficult. And, and I would say that probably for a lot of members of cabinets, you know, that they, they become so enmeshed inside the machine of, the poli of politics and the way that politics is done that it's hard for them to, to just, you know, be themselves. And, and maybe they don't know who the, they are anymore. You know, you, you stick a camera on somebody and, and, and you become somebody else. I, I, and I guess we all do it, you know, in front of a, uh, you know, a group of students. We are, you know, we take on the role of, you know, the lecturer as opposed to just the person talking to somebody else. Um, so, you know, I, I guess in, in authenticity is something that it, it depends on that performance and, and, you know, how much we perform ourselves. But I think, you know, I think politicians have become under so much scrutiny about their emotions and their feelings and, and who they are and their answers to questions and those fears, um, which is part of, you know, a, a, a media problem, the way the media report politics, that they, they have responded. But this, I must admit, this government seems to be one of the worst at not answering questions and avoiding answering questions and deflecting and appearing less honest. Um, I'm not sure if that's my own personal bias, um, but I can I can think of so many examples where these things you know, are, are done and, and and you know contradiction, failure to answer questions, answering a question with a completely different topic. Um, you know, it it it's it's striking to me. <laughs> Thank you, Darren, and thank you for the question as well, Paul. When you said there about politicians not really knowing their true selves, that reminded me to the cringeworthy moment when David Cameron was confused whether he supported West Ham or Aston Villa. He wasn't quite sure which team he supported. If you've not seen that, it's worth watching that clip on uh, those clips on YouTube. But um, we're at five o'clock now, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank Darren for volunteering his time to talk to us about his paper today, and also thank everyone for attending and for all the brilliant questions. Um, wherever you are, I hope everyone's safe and well and the new academic year has started well. And also just to plug our, our next um, seminar in the, in, in the series with Abby Rhodes, our, she'll be talking about her new book, Social Movements in Elections, UK Anti-Austerity and Environmental Campaigning 2015 to 2019.